latest episode of the Merck Career on Purpose podcast. Career on Purpose will explore the unique job opportunities, career paths, training, and professional growth opportunities available across the globe at Merck. From first-person interviews with successful and inspiring Merck employees, to helpful tips, tricks, and insights for finding a job in the world of life sciences, the Career on Purpose podcast will give you, our listeners, an exclusive look into the careers of today and tomorrow. Whether you have a diploma, a degree, or somewhere in between, this podcast will provide actionable advice on how to uncover exciting career opportunities at Merck and how to thrive in an increasingly competitive professional landscape. Thank you for joining us as we dive into all the aspects of Merck that make a fulfilling career and how your next job plays a role in our purpose, which proudly states, we use the power of leading edge science to save and improve lives around the world. Joining us for our first episode are two wonderful people who are as passionate as anyone you will find about Merck and the opportunities the company provides. Our first guest is Ngozi Motalewa, Enterprise HR Lead, Skills First Discovery Talent Initiative at Merck. Ngozi, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. And alongside her for this episode is Robert Robertson, Enterprise Shared Services Manager at Merck. Robert, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate you having me on. Ngozi and Robert will be highlighting a wonderful program at Merck called Skills First. It is a revolution in the talent acquisition space that helps develop, attract, advance, and retain talented individuals who may not have four-year degrees. Ngozi, would you mind kicking things off and telling us about the origins of Skills First, maybe how it works, and a little bit of the ins and outs? Sure, Joe. Happy to. And I I like to describe Skills First and the work that we're doing as transformational, right? We're we're transforming our talent practices so that we are really looking at skills rather than a traditional four-year degree as the critical determinant of job success. Um, And we're applying that thinking and that paradigm shift across all of the pillars of our talent strategy, which includes, you know, hiring, developing as well as advancing talent within our organization. This work is inspired by our partnership with 110, a nonprofit organization formed in 2020 with a mission of hiring, promoting, and advancing 1 million Black individuals without a four-year degree into family-sustaining roles over the next 10 years, hence the name 110. Um, But our commitment really started there and really expanded beyond that over the last three years, and we've expanded our partnership portfolio to include other partners such as Year Up, um, as well as launching our our Skills First um, apprenticeship program. And this focus on skills is really supported by by data, right? So, So we know that hiring based on skills is five times more predictive of future performance and hiring um, on education alone. And more importantly, inclusive companies are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. Um, So there's data to support why the skills first approach is good for business, good for talent, as well as good for, for society at large. For talent that wants to get involved, it's really about believing in yourself, believing in your potential and really putting yourself forward to compete for some of our open positions. And we actually have a a skills first um, webpage where individuals can go to get information as well as to to apply for roles. But it really starts with that belief in yourself and and understanding that there are companies um, like Merck who are committed to this work, committed to transforming lives, um, and committed to you know bringing diverse perspectives and the diverse talent into our organization to ultimately lead to better business outcomes. And Gozi, I think you mentioned two groups who already benefit from this program, not just people looking for jobs and people who have those skills, but the company itself. But maybe you could talk about how exactly people who have you know have these skills that maybe either are uncovered or hidden actually benefit from this program specifically with Merck? How does kind of Merck help you along this journey um, to ensure that you can take advantage of your skills? You know, I think first it starts with access to opportunity, right? Part of the reason why this skills first paradigm shift is happening is when we look at the data, about 60% of adults in the U.S. do not have a four-year degree. Um, So that's a significant 
part of the population that we have not been accessing and have not been, um, you know, promoting kind of access to these opportunities. And, and now now that's changing. Um, you know, talent, once they come into our organization, you know, they're able to, you know, have access to a family sustaining career. So this is not simply about getting a job. It's about creating a meaningful career that can support them, but also support their family. And over time, um, support future generations um, as well. And we support them from the day they come into our organization, whether it's through mentorship, participating in our employee resource groups, taking advantage of the broad portfolio of our benefits programs, and you know, really thinking about the two dimensions of not only career development and advancement, but also connection, right? Because I think for anyone coming into corporate America or even just starting any job for the first time, you you want to have that sense of connection, not only with your immediate team, but connection to the vision and purpose of the organization. Um, and you also want to feel like you can show up as your authentic self, right? Because that's really important, particularly as we thinking about, you know, bringing in new pools of talent that, you know, they feel like this is, you know, Merck is a company where they can come in and be their, their full and authentic selves and in doing so be better able to create value for the organization. And Gozi, you early on there, you mentioned opportunity. And I think I need to switch over to Robert here because there may not be a person who believes in the power of providing people opportunities more than you, Robert. So maybe you can start with introducing yourself and giving our listeners just a bit about your background and the experiences that shaped your early life. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I would uh, first say is that uh, I'm, I'm truly honored um, to have the opportunity um, to speak with you all. Um, about such an important initiative. Um, I don't take it lightly that um, I've been blessed with the platform to be able to to highlight all the good work that the initiative is doing and all the good people who are taking advantage of it. But when we talk about uh, my early uh, experiences, I think when we talk about an opportunity, right, uh, being prepared for the opportunity is 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 important as well when it comes. And, and I have to um, give a lot of credit and honor um, to my upbringing. I have to give some, uh, not some, but uh, a lot of credit uh, to my parents, uh, uh, particularly right now, my father. I think um, this whole journey that I've been on over the past year since I've uh, been a part of Merck um, has caused me to do some reflecting. And when you when you look back over your life and you see certain things and, and how things have played out, it, it takes me back to some things that my father always instilled in all seven of us. I come from a family of, of seven. And he always told us and taught us about uh, hard work, uh, work ethic, and, and being um, prepared when your opportunity comes. And he always used to tell me um, something that, that, that is funny because I understand it much more now. You never know who's watching you and who's going to give you your opportunity. Um, and my father passed when I was young. He passed when I was 16. And when I when I think about the conversations that we had up until that point, he would always tell me about things that I would think, um, why are you telling me this? I'm too young to even like really care about the importance of being responsible and all of these things. Almost like he knew he wouldn't see me in manner. And I think about when I was eight. And um, this this will shape a lot of, of, of where we're going with this conversation. I, eight years old, my father, um, he was of limited in education. Um, my mother and, and my father, they migrated from the South, but he took pride in his work. Um, he had a job as a uh, parking lot attendant um, for a bank. And in the summertime, um, I would uh, go to work with him. And, and, you know, back then it wasn't electronic arms that raised up the electric cars in and out. You had a parking lot attendant who would have to get out of the little hut and walk over to you and maybe give you some directions and things. And, and, and I remember those summers and we would sit in the hut and, um, and eat tomatoes. And it would always be extremely hot. And just we had just had a fan blowing on us. But I loved it. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And my father smoked cigars. Um, unfortunately, yes, he smoked cigars. But what he would do is um, he would always, when someone pulled into the lot, he would put his cigar down, 
make sure his clothes was appropriate. He was very, very neat. You would almost think he was too neat for, for that particular job, but he took pride in his appearance. He would always walk out, greet the people, um, tell them where they needed to park. And one day I said, Dad, like, why do you go through all of this almost staging before you leave the little shack we was in? And he told me, he said, um, um, Junior, he said, because individuals don't want to see someone walking up to them, talking to them, blowing cigar smoke in their face. And he said, and you always want to be neat, he said, because that's being professional. And you should always want to be neat and you should always want people to see you a certain way. Um, and he always said that um, you represent something more than just you, which it's so funny because it's connected to this initiative when you when you talk about it. But he would always tell me you are uh, representing something more than just you. You you have a, a obligation to carry yourself a certain way. He would tell me stories about our family, um, his family um, before him. Very proud man, you know. And so he would tell stories where Joe, it would almost be like, it would take me, his stories could take me back to the line of my people, back to the beginning. Like I could see them and it gives you so much pride. And that's the type of man that he was. And lo and behold, um, shortly after that conversation, um, he came home one day and he said that he got a promotion. He was no longer going to be in the parking lot. And there was an individual that would come maybe once a month now, my father didn't know who the individual was, but he happened to be one of the vice presidents of, of this branch. And one day he went inside, he asked the branch manager, who's the individual running the lot? And they said, Bob, it's Bobby Robertson. They said, Do he, does he have a license? So they said, yes, he's, that he's being wasted. We need to give him an opportunity doing something else because of how he carries himself, his professionalism. Let's put him in the leasing department. They put him in the leasing department. He came home. He said, well, we won't be able to leave North Philly, but I will have enough money to put all y'all in Catholic school. So you may not have to live in North Philly. That act of kindness, major, because it taught me a lot, even in Mandia. That act taught me about hard work. It taught me about work ethic. It taught me about being ready for your opportunity and also it taught me about sacrifice. Because if you don't sacrifice for what you want, then what you want will become the sacrifice. And I've said that to my team, um, it's been told to me. And I think that sets the stage for opportunities that came um, after my father passed. Um, so I think him instilling those core values in me um, helped me uh, uh, many years later but I think it, it, it definitely helped me prepare myself for opportunities that came um, after. Yeah, I think we'll talk a little bit later about how you're continuing to pass down those those lessons uh, that you learned from your father all those years ago to your job at Merck today. But maybe you can talk about how you got to where you are at Merck today. So what took you from you know being a little kid uh, working with your dad uh, in in that uh, in that parking lot booth to mm -hmm. to today. Long journey, but uh, I'd love to hear it. As I stated, uh, my father passed when I was sixteen. Um, after that, of course, there there, there was a, a very uh, shift in my life, and what I had to do was kind of cope with that. As a sixteen year old, you don't you don't know um, um, the trauma that sometimes comes about through through life. But um, I did lose my way a little bit. But fortunately, a friend of mine, his brother, uh, he saw more in, in me than at the time I saw in myself. And he said, you were better than what you are displaying. And he gave me an opportunity entry level into research at an institution. What he also gave me was uh, his faith. Um, I've said before, he allowed me to borrow his faith until I could find my own. That That's such a true statement. And um, he allowed me to grow. He mentored me. I was able to move um, through the ranks at that institution. And I spent quite a few years there. Moved on to another institution, uh, still in research. And uh, the opportunity came up in regard to Skills First 110. Uh, the opportunity came up and someone said, uh, Rob, you know what? This is a good initiative. You need to research and look into it. They were already uh, employed by Merck. They said, we think you could lend something to this. 
Um, they thought that my, my skills that I had already had were transferable. And they said, you should at least explore it and maybe you'll want to apply for the position. And when I read it and saw what its core um, values were and the individuals that they were trying to help and give an opportunity to, I couldn't not at least attempt to be a part of it um, because I think I can relate to every individual who's had an opportunity uh, through this initiative. So for me, it was it, it was a no brainer. Um, I had to do it. I had to give back. A lot of things have been uh, done for me and I've, I've been blessed with opportunity. So you have to pay it forward. So I apply, I got the position and then I've been here uh, just over a year. And just over a year coming to eventually manage a, a growing team of employees at a global company, I mean, crazy impressive, um, super impressive. And maybe you can share some of the key lessons you learned, even, the, even in this past year or a little mm -hmm. bit before, um, and how mentoring has played a role in your success. And obviously, you're doing that, passing that mm -hmm. down uh, to others now, but in your own success. Uh, mentorship has played a major role in my success, and I'm, and I'm still... Uh, being mentored, I have a host of people who are always willing to teach me and allow to help me to grow. Our manager here, Sabrina, she's awesome. Um, she's a very caring person and very smart and willing to impart her wisdom um, at all times. Uh, so we have a team of people and we have a diverse team of people, a diverse group of, of managers. Um, some have been a part of Merck for some years, so they have years of experience within uh, this culture here at Merck. So they've been very instrumental. My counterpart, Aliasa, has been just excellent at, at giving me um, wise counsel. Um, the list goes on and on about mentorship, but I think the important part about mentorship is mentorship allows the person that you're mentoring to see the goal. Um, I think a lot of times you can't reach a goal that you can't see. So when you're a mentor, you're actually the goal that they can see and that they can see that maybe I can uh, obtain the same places that you've reached. So I think uh, uh, being a mentor is, is key to the development of, of me and my role and the individuals that we hear that we have here at the Enterprise Share Service Center. You mentioned borrowing, uh, borrowing someone else's faith before, which is such a great line. And I'm sure you still had to kind of do that, like convincing someone, like you said, Seeing a goal or envisioning a goal that you can't see is so difficult. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people may need convincing that that is an actual goal that is attainable for them. Um, and I'm sure that's all involved in skills first. But maybe you could talk about kind of how you help people who may not see those goals in themselves or that faith in themselves, mm -hmm. how you can work to help instill that in them. Because it's such a hard thing to do. But yeah, you're doing a great yep. job at it. The key component is relationship building um, um, because individuals have to be able uh, um, to trust you. So I think building a relationship first um, um, that you have their best interests, um, that that you want to see them um, succeed. And I think it is it's a process. I've told uh, my counterparts and, and my team as well, you know, being a good manager is excellent, but it's different than being a good leader. They're two different things. Um, and so if you are going to be a good manager, that's great. You'll have success. But if you want to be a good leader, you're going to help others be successful. And I think that it takes um, a lot out of you um, to be a leader um, because you have to do more um, than you would basically have to do if you're just going to be a manager and you're going to be a good manager. And there's nothing wrong with that because I, I, I think it requires a commitment uh, when you want to uh, uh, lead. And I think that is what helps the individuals that come on board because you have to remember a lot of these individuals come from um, walks of life where they have been told all their lives they have been disqualified for whatever reason. So there is a lot of pain there that, that, that you had to weave through to get them to see that the floor is not going to drop from underneath. And so those things require you to have patience and empathy, um, require you to always try to be doing your very best. Um, you lead by example. No one's perfect. I'm not definitely not perfect, but I try to always have principles. 
And I think those things are key uh, when individuals are, are, are looking at you um, for guidance and leadership and mentorship. Um, so it's really about time and it's about patience and it's about you wanting to see them succeed. It's probably for so many people seeing a company like Merck, this gigantic, huge company that, um, you know, probably thousands of roles that someone could potentially take. But to see yourself in that is is difficult. So maybe for you, Robert, why is uplifting individual, individuals who don't typically have these kind of opportunities to work for a company like Merck so important? Uh, there's tons of jobs out there, but Merck is really kind of a unicorn um, in the things that it offers, the, the tools it offers people. So why is it so important to be doing this, not just generally, but at Merck? Merck? has done something um, incredible. I actually think, honestly, uh, sometimes I don't think Merck really understands what, what they've done um, because they do it so much because um, it's always about the people. Um, they say it's about the people, not the profit. So they're used to doing the right thing. Um, but I think this is important because just think about this. Merck has created a space for individuals not only to have an opportunity at a career and help other people through this career. So they're giving individuals the opportunity to do good and do well at the same time, that part. Then the space that they've also created gives them an opportunity to heal some pain. And, and, and pain meaning um, now you can feed your children. Now you can put them in adequate schools. Now you have adequate health care. You know, when you don't have those things, that's pain. That's a space that uh, uh, Merck has created, a space to address all those things. But then here's the here's the kicker, Joe. They do all of that, and then they have the audacity to also say, and come as you are. That's powerful. That's powerful, and that's bold for organization to say, here's what we're going to do. Um, so I have I, the, the utmost respect uh, uh, for Merck and, and, and thank them, not only for myself, but for all the individuals that I'm looking out at now and the offices that are working. And it's a powerful thing. Um, I think uh, it, it's something that, that definitely needs to be spoken about. And I, I don't take it lightly when I have the opportunity um, to share uh, this great work that, that Merck has done for so many people. Yeah, you said it. And I want you, I kind of want you to reinforce it. I mean, that this program doesn't just support the people who get jobs and being able to put food on your family's table, being able to send your children to a different school or a better school or whatever. This has impacts potentially, I don't, I don't want to sound too outrageous here, but down, down the line, generations down the line, benefit from one person potentially getting a job that can change the course of a family's trajectory. So maybe just get a little bit more yeah. into how this program supports people who are not just those actively and directly participating. I think um, when, when you talk about it in that perspective, you have to now talk about the individuals that many who are, are, are part of this initiative and helping to, to, uh, to move the needle along, they'll never meet them. Uh, you're talking about children now who will probably be the first uh, ones to go off to school to be able to live in a decent home. I talked earlier about my father and I talked about the, the stories in regard to our family, uh, uh, my people. And, and in those stories, you hear the highs and the lows and the things. There are going to be stories now told about um, why has grandma got this nice house? Because Merck hired her such and such amount of years ago. See, that's powerful. Somebody's going to be a part of somebody's history now, somebody's story now, you know? And I think that when you look at it like that, you're addressing families, you're addressing communities. Um, and, and it's so organic because it is in line with what Merck does. Merck helps people. So it, it, it's, it's in line, it's a, it's a different avenue, but it, it, but, it, but it reaches the same goal. Um, they help people. Um, and so I think when you talk about just the impact that this initiative has had and, and Merck um, saying we're going to do this uh, is, is major because they're going to um, impact uh, generations of families that they won't even be able to count. 
it's it's incredible. It's just about practicing gratitude, which I think sometimes in our jobs we don't always think about. But I think putting it in this perspective is so helpful. And Gozi, I think as you as we're all hearing from Robert, he's just one of the success stories and one person leading others to create their own success story. But can you talk a little bit and give some uh, give us some information about the impact of Skills First that we may not have talked about already? Sure, ha- happy to. And I just want to start by saying it's it's always an honor to hear Rob's story. And I've I've had the pleasure of of knowing him since he joined our organization and and continue to be inspired by the journey that he's on. And and I'm really privileged to be alongside him on this journey. So I want to first start with our commitment as a company to this work. You know, it started with our former CEO, Ken Frazier, who um, helped kind of co-found the 110 Coalition, which, as I mentioned, inspired our, our broader work with Skills First. And our current CEO, Rob Davis, as he stepped into his role, continued that commitment. And I would say um, that commitment is also echoed through many layers of leadership within our organization. And some of the, the outcomes that we've seen while we've been on this journey, I'll, I'll share that in terms of roles that we've posted over the last three years collectively, it's it's almost 2,000 roles across all of our sites um, in the U.S. As I mentioned, we, in addition to full-time opportunities, we also have cohort-based programs, which are short-term assignments, and we have over um, 100 individuals that we bring in um, without a four-year degree and give them access to um, meaningful career opportunities as well as an opportunity to continue to develop themselves professionally. But I would say more important than the numbers are are the stories. And I think Rob's story is just one of many examples of, of what's possible when you investing, developing your skills, you you believe in yourself and your potential, and more importantly, take advantage of those opportunities when when they present themselves. And I I can relate with what Rob shared about, you know, sometimes, particularly with individuals that have not had access in the past, right? Their view of the future, their view of career could be very limited and it could be limited by their current circumstances. It could be limited by narratives that they've they've heard throughout their lives. It could be limited by trauma that they've experienced um, firsthand. So I hope that for for anyone that's listening to this podcast, you know, that Rob's story is really an inspiration um, and also validation that, you know, if you're someone who's doubting yourself, really believe and know that this could be you on our, our on this podcast episode you know a year from now so um so i i feel really honored to be able to to do the work that i do it's it's truly a, a mix of passion um and purpose and like i said i think in terms of the impact it's it's really the lives like rob that that we're we're transforming i think that's really why we do the work that we do yeah robert i'm sure Based on hearing you and Ngozi, there's a lot of people out there who are interested now in this. Uh, so what advice maybe would you give to anyone who is considering or would consider uh, applying uh, for Skills First? First thing is to remove all their fears. Take a chance. Take a chance on yourself. I would also say that it is important that you understand that it's a journey. Uh, change is difficult. Uh, change is difficult in, in, in the beginning. It's, it's messy in the middle, but then it's gorgeous at the end. You know, and I say all that to say change is just a process. Um, and they have to be willing to go through the process. And they have to be willing to understand that there are going to be some hard days. There's going to be um, some days where they're going to feel like uh, they can't do it. But you have to remember the goals, you know. And, and I talked about um, sacrifice. Uh, there's nothing... Uh, that you, that you want that doesn't require sacrifice, and and I speak that to my team um, because I think sometimes you have to be reminded that you have to sacrifice some things. Uh, it, it's important, you know, it's part of the journey. Having good work ethic, being able to fall and get back up, is going to be key. Learning from your mistakes because you want to uh, make many. Um, you learn from them, um, but then also. You see other people, so if they can do it, you can do it. Um, I think that's important as well. I have some of 
uh, the best people that I work alongside with every day. It's a total of 56 individuals down here at the uh, Enterprise Shared Service Center uh, combined with, with management. And they're some of the hardest working people uh, that you'll want to meet. Is every day an easy day? No, uh, but we figure it out um, and we keep pushing. Um, and, and that's what I would tell individuals um, to just have faith in themselves because once you've gotten this far, you can continue on. And, and that's what I think I, I would tell individuals. Um, work ethic, character, integrity, all of those things play a major part in your success, um, not only as a human being, but in whatever role that you may take on. Yeah, as Ngozi said. Finally, Ngozi, can you talk about maybe some of the roles that are available just generally with Skills First and where people should go if they're interested in applying, if they see something interesting? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we we have a range of different opportunities within our company for skills first talent. Um, you heard Rob's story and, and he works in our clinical trial support operations, part of the organization focused on data management. We also have individuals in IT, in digital marketing, in manufacturing, in project management, in procurement. So there is a broad range of opportunities for individuals with different experiences, different skills, and different backgrounds. So for anyone interested in, in learning about these opportunities and applying for roles, and I, and I hope that there'll be many people interested after hearing Rob's story and hearing this podcast, we have a career site dedicated specifically to Skills First. Um, and you'll not only be able to learn about the roles, you'll learn more about our company and also hear stories from other individuals that have um, joined our company through our Skills First program. So, so we'll make sure to, to link to our Skills First website in the episode description. Yeah, as Ngozi said, please check that out. There's plenty of useful info about the program, about how to apply. And if you have any questions, I am almost positive. Uh, both Robert and Ngozi will be thrilled to answer them so, uh, so we can have you reach out to them as well. And Mark for Skills First, and Robert for sharing your incredible journey and your story with our audience. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Pleasure to be here. Finally, I want to thank our listeners as well for tuning into this episode. To your future episodes, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts. For the Merck Career on Purpose podcast, I'm Joe McIntyre. Thanks for listening.